Good morning. This morning we started with the good news. Good news that Kalai finally got a two wheeler. You know, so we, we didn't pray for that. We should pray for that, pray for her and for the people in Bangalore, uh, the people who are on the road. You know, uh, talking about uh, vehicles. Um, I saw Pastor uh, Augustine's uh, DP. Did you, any of you notice? He's sitting on this mean bike, and I asked him what bike it is, and he said it is a Yamaha 1300cc. My goodness, I was jealous, <laughs> absolutely. Right? I'm confessing it from the pulpit. Okay. <laughs> so he's having fun. So praise God for that. <laughs> right? Um, well, <laughs> coming back to the sermon, we are, uh, you know, <laughs> so today is the sixth uh, part of the series uh, on encounters with, with God, and that's what we have been looking of we started off with this with this with this uh, challenge or by realization that having an encounter with god is one one great reason for all of us to come to church sunday after sunday right that was one of the premises that we started off with and i hope that's what you've been having uh, in the past uh, five weeks and we will continue uh, doing that right and um, i hope you remember some of the points that we studied in the previous parts we are not watchful. We will miss the opportunity to have encounter with God, just as Jacob did. And it is entirely up to us to have that encounter because the first party of the encounter, God Almighty, he is omnipresent. He is always there, always willing. So if we are not able to have an encounter, we can't blame him. It's only us. It's up to us, right? God encounters are for everyone. It does not depend on your spiritual status or your knowledge of Bible or you know, your preaching capability and stuff like that, it is for everyone. It is an everyday affair. It is not a one in a once in a lifetime affair. We need to seek that encounter repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. God encounters are intensely personal. It does not matter if you're sitting in a mega church or if you're sitting in a group of one or two people. When, it, when you have an encounter with the Almighty, it is just you and Him. It is intensely personal. God encounters always, always, always results in change. Sometimes the change could be dramatic as it happened in Paul's case, but sometimes it could be very subtle as it happened in Jacob's case. And of course, as it happened in my case too. And uh, changes happen in three areas, vision, character, and relationships. Those are the three areas that I have listed in my book, Not So With You. Encounters with God changes our vision. It enhances the scope of our vision from a narrow vision. It takes to a broader vision covering the whole world and it aligns it with God's vision. And we saw this happen in Paul's life. And God encounters will change our character. They'll change our character for good. And, and, and we saw the character changes that happened in Peter's life, right? And we especially looked at two aspects pride and fear and we said it needs to be replaced with humility and confidence and we also saw that humility and confidence need to be balanced because if you have humility and don't have the confidence you are denying the grace of god if you if you have confidence and not humility you are denying the power of god right so you got to have balance between humility and confidence so today in this part 6 of the series we are going to look at the third imperative, which is the relationships, the relationships that will be impacted by encounters with God. Now, when we look at relationships, I'm sure all of us realize that there are two relationships that we got to look at, right? One is the, the, the horizontal relationship that we have with God, uh, sorry, the vertical relationship that we have with our maker, with God Almighty, with the Yahweh, with the Lord our Father, and then the horizontal relationship that we have with each other, right? So in both those relationships, uh, you know, and one is incomplete without the other. The good news is that an encounter with God impacts both those relationships. Now we have looked at primarily three, three characters, right? We looked at Jacob, we looked at Paul, we looked at Peter. So we, today we're going to go back to Jacob, right? I, I want to stick with this trio, uh, you know, of, of people. Uh, one from the Old Testament and two from the New Testament, continue to look at them. And so today we are going back to Jacob. I love that guy, Jacob, right? Uh, I, I, I was quite like him, and there are still similarities between him and me. So we know, when did his first encounter happen? Yeah, he was running away 
because uh, Isa would, uh, you know, uh, threaten to kill him, right? And he was running away to Padan Aram to meet uh, Laban and get a wife for himself. And on the way, in a place called Luz, is where he has his first encounter with uh, God in Genesis chapter 28. Now, just look at Jacob's life before that, before that. Do you see in the Bible anywhere where Jacob prays to God, where Jacob seeks God's counsel? No, we don't. We don't. We don't even know whether God, Jacob, uh, you know, personally knew God. Right? We can probably assume that he was an obedient child, unlike Esau. Right? He was an obedient child. He obeyed, especially his mother. Especially when mother told him the bad things to do, he was very obedient. Right? So, so we know that he was an obedient child, but we cannot for sure know whether he was a pious child or not, right? whether he was spiritual or not, we don't know, we don't know. We see, we see him seeking his father's blessing, but never God's blessing, right? So I would say that, you know, that it would be safe for us to assume that he was a passive church goer, right? How many of us are passive church goers? All right, I will not ask that question, right? <laughs> Uh, so it was safe to assume that he was a passive church goer. So he go, went to church, right, for other reasons, you know. And again, I said, I am quite like Jacob. So let me take me, take me back to my own conversion story once more, right? Now, before I started going to church, you know how I started going to church to, to drop Leslie, to show for Leslie and, you know, bring her back from church. That's how my association with church started. But before that, before I even met uh, Leslie, I used to go a lot of temples. I had gone to a lot of temples. Right? And, but my going to temples had nothing to do with the gods or spirituality, right? It was either to please my parents or to see someone else who was going to the same temple. You get the drift, right? I don't want to explain it more, right? So, so it, was, it, was, it was certainly not for any spiritual reasons that I went to the temples, right? And it, it has nothing to do with God or, 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 or spirituality. And Jacob was like that, probably, right? He was, uh, you know, he, he knew his parents worshipped uh, the, the Yahweh, his parents worshipped Yahweh, and it was sufficient for him, right? And so it's not surprising that if you look at earlier life of Jacob, he was trying to live his life by his own plans, his own ways, his own deceptions, his own lies, and that's what we see in Jacob's life, right? His own course through, through deceptions and lies and things like that. Now, it, in Luz, what is called as Luz, or what I call as Bethel 1.0, right? I, don't, I call it Bethel 1.0 because by that time it was not even called Bethel, and we will go back to Bethel in this sermon itself, right? So, uh, you know, as, as, as Genesis 28, 19 puts, the city was called Luz, and that is where he goes, and, uh, you know, and, and, and he, that is where he has his first encounter with God in a dream, what is known as Jacob's Ladder, and we have seen that in the first and second sermons of this series. Now, God appears to him in a dream, and then he wakes up, and then after he wakes up, this is probably the first time, actually, this is the first time that the Bible records that he acknowledges the presence of God. This is the first time in the Bible that you see Jacob acknowledges the presence of God. Now, imagine, Jacob is the chosen one to build the Israel, build the nation, build the, to, to, to make sure that the Abrahamic covenant comes into place. Jacob is the chosen one, and that has been told to his mother. But when do we see him acknowledging God? Only after his first direct encounter with God in in, in, in Genesis chapter 28. So, you know, if you, if you go into, if, if you look at Facebook, right, and some of you have got Facebook accounts, in Facebook there is something called a relationship status, right? So if you have looked at the Jacob's Facebook page earlier, it would have, you know, his relationship with God would have shown, I don't care, right? So that would have been his relationship status with God. Don't care, right? Don't care about God. Now that changes to acknowledging God. Hey, yes, there is a God and he is present in this place, even though I did not know it. How do we know that? Genesis 28, 17. Can you open your Bibles to that? Genesis 28, verse 17 says this. How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. 
and this is the gate of heaven. His first ever acknowledgement of God. And that's why, that's why he calls it Bethel. Bethel, which means house of God. So this is the first change that we see in his relationship with God after, you know, as a result of an encounter with God. But as we see in the earlier parts of the series, his change is very subtle. The changes in Jacob is very subtle. It is not dramatic as it happened in Paul's case. Now, even though he acknowledged the presence of God, what did he do? We have seen this earlier. When he made a vow after uh, seeing this thing, what was, what was his vow? How did we qualify that vow? It was very conditional, right? Go to, uh, go, go to Genesis 28, 28, 20 to 22. Can one of you read it, please? Genesis 28, 20, and 20, 20 to 22. This is where after his first encounter with God, after acknowledging that there is, this is the place of God, he makes a vow, okay? Genesis 28, 20 to 22. Twenty two also? Do you notice the conditionality of this of this vow? If God will be with me, if he will keep me in this way, if he will give me bread to eat, if he will give me clothing to put on. If he will take me back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. Right? Five different conditions before he says the Lord has to be my God. God, you have to meet this condition first, right? As if God is dependent on him, right? And then he goes on. I will give you tithe, but <laughs> only if what? Only, you know, you know if I will give you uh, you know, the, the, this thing, only again, if you meet all these conditions, right? As I said, you know, when we used to go to the temples, it always used to be, um, you know, uh, you offer something if, 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 you know, um, you, know you, you, you make a vow, generally saying that, okay, look, if, if my, uh, you know, son passes or if I get a male child, you know, I will give you this or I will do this and all that stuff, right? So I, it reminds me of that. It's all conditional. It's a conditional vow. Lord, if you do me these, these things, I will call you my Lord and I will give you a tenth of what all that I have, right? Conditional. This is not an unconditional acceptance of God and his grace, right? It's not. This is a very conditional acceptance of God's grace. But the beauty is, we have seen it, God does not give up on us. God does not give up on us. God did not give up on Pete, Jacob. God did not give up on Peter. God did not give up on Madana, right? God does not give up on us. So he continues to encounter, continues to encounter, right? Uh, uh, and and well, well, because he made a promise. He made a promise. So he continues to encounter with Jacob. And with the, each encounter that he has after this, we see Jacob's relationship with God getting more and more mature or improving, right? His trust in God improves with every, um, you know, the, the, the vertical relationship between Jacob and God. And, and, and that relationship peaks when God calls Jacob to Bethel 2.0. Second time, God comes and says, hey, it's time for you to go back to Bethel. Where does that happen? Genesis chapter 35. So we are switching from Genesis chapter 28. A lot of things happen between those two. And in Genesis chapter 35, God comes and says, Jacob, it is time for you to go back to Bethel and complete, fulfill your vow. Now, I... You know, I always think that there's no coincidences with God, right? Now, wh why does God choose one particular time to come? And to know that, you got to go back to Genesis chapter 34. What is described in Genesis chapter 34 is the horrid, horrid scenes. 
as of what Jacob's sons come at. Those of you, you can keep it open and you can just go through that. Genesis chapter 34 is called the Dina incident, right? In Shechem. So he, he goes there and, you know, and then uh, Jacob has only one daughter, Dina. Dina goes out partying with her uh, girlfriends and, uh, you know, the, the prince uh, Shechem sees her, falls in love, a case of uh, love at first sight, and then violates her. But Shechem seems to be a pretty honest man. After doing what he shouldn't have done, he, re he realizes that, but he says, I'm in love with this girl and I want to marry her. He does the most appropriate thing under the circumstances. He doesn't, does not abandon Dina. He does not abandon Dina and say that, okay, look, I don't want to have anything with you. And he does the right thing by approaching Jacob through the right channels. He doesn't go directly to Dina and tells her. He tells his father, Hammer, and his father, Hammer, goes to Jacob and asks for the hand of Dina in marriage. Now, this is where you saw that I, I told you, you know, Jacob was a passive churchgoer. So his passive nature comes back here. Right? What does Genesis 34, 5 say? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Jacob held his peace. Jacob kept silent. Jacob said nothing until the sons came. Whose daughter is Dina? Jacob's daughter. And who has come to talk to him? Shechem's father. But Jacob says, my sons will decide what to do, not me. <laughs> you know, one of the most passive, passing the buck as we could call it in today's uh, language, right? So he just passes the buck to his, <laughs> to his, to his sons. Now, you know, uh, uh, you know, there's a saying which goes like father, like son. How many of you have heard that, right? So this is, an, this is a case where we see exactly that is what happened. What was Jacob? A deceiver, a cheater, a liar, and trying to run his life through deception and cheating and lies and stuff like that. So you would, would you expect his sons to be any better? <laughs> no, you wouldn't, right? Uh, I always tell this story, right, where uh, the parents go to the uh, principal and the principal sits and uh, tells the parents that, look, guy, look, you know, your, your son has got a problem. He's in second standard. He steals pencils and erasers and stuff like that from his classmates. And uh, the parents are shocked. And the father especially is shocked. And the father says, Madam, I am embarrassed. I am troubled. And I don't know why he should do this because everything that he needs and much more than what he needs, I can bring it from my office and give it to him. So, <laughs> like father, like son. So the sons of Jacob turns out to be masters at deception. Right? They want to outdo Jacob in deception. Genesis 34, 13 says, but the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hammer, his father, and spoke deceitfully. Spoke deceitfully because he had defiled Dina, their sister. Spoke deceitfully. So they picked up this trick from Jacob very well. Even I don't know whether Jacob taught him or they just, <laughs> they just picked it up or whatever it is. But they knew what is deception, what is cunning, and how to run our lives without seeking God's help or God's interference. We don't need God's help, right? So what they do? They agree that Shechem, hey, Shechem can marry Dina, but under condition. What is the condition? Every male in that city must be circumcised. Right? So, poor Hammer, Hammer and Shechem, they think that you know, they, are, they, are, they are sort of doing the conversion game and they can join the Jews and, you know, and they can be part of the Jewish, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> Jewish nation and all that stuff. So they go talk to the men in the, men in the city. All of them finally agree. They get uh, circumcised and they are in pain. And what does Jacob's sons do when they are in pain? They go and kill every single male in the city. Every single male is killed. Not only they do killing, they plunder the city. They plunder every this thing. They take 
people as slaves and all that stuff. And Jacob is obviously after, after passing the buck to his sons, now he is afraid. <laughs> right? When he was passing the buck, he was quite all right. He was confident the sons will do the right thing, not realizing that the sons will follow his path. But then once, he, once the sons do this, he becomes afraid. Right? And in Genesis 34, 30, he actually scolds his children saying, what have you done? You have put my life at risk. Right? And every, 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 every country, every city, every nation around uh, this place will now be looking to revenge us. So now, remember, look at this situation. This is where, the, this is where Jacob is. This is where Jacob is. And it is exactly at this point that God appears to him in verse 35, 1. 34 describes all this and ends with Jacob's fear, gripping fear, saying that, look, the nations are going to kill me. All the nations around this place are going to kill me. And that is the time when God appears to him and asks him to remember his vow that he took in Bethel 1.0 and ask him to return to Bethel to fulfill his vow. Now, the good thing is, because he was in such a troubled state and because God appeared to him at this point in time, when he was at the lowest, when he was at the lowest point in time, once again, fearing for his life. Remember, he is al almost always fearing for his life, right? The first time when he was running to Bethel, uh, when, when he came to Bethel, it was fearing, fearing for his life because Esau wanted to kill him. Now, second time, when he's going back to Bethel, he's fearing for his life because his sons had done deception and he knew that the whole nation around them would be wanting to kill him. But what it has is, it has got a profound effect on Jacob's relationship with God. Now, till this time, even though Jacob has had an encounter with God multiple times, we have seen that, I think at least twice, uh, Jacob has had an encounter with God, with God appearing in his uh, dreams, once in, uh, once in uh, the Bethel 1.0, and then another time in, in, in Padan uh, Aram, in, in uh, Laban's place, uh, asking him to go back uh, to his father's place and all that stuff. So even though he had a relationship with God, it was not exclusive, right? So I saw the first one was, don't care about God. His relationship status changes to acknowledge. Yes, I acknowledge that there is a God, but it is still not exclusive. Because as the Bible says, he had tolerated worship of other gods, foreign gods in his household. In his household. Now, if you use a modern dating term, his relationship with Yahweh was not exclusive, right? It was not exclusive. It was just a relationship, not an exclusive relationship. He had tolerated idols in the house, household. It is after the Lord encounters him, after the Shechem incident, where he was at his lowest, where he was fearing for his life, when his confidence is completely take, shaken, that is aware of God's grace and God's promise. And then, and then, and then only, he decides to make his relationship with God exclusive. Can someone, one of you read Genesis 35, 2 to 3, please? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. He does two things here. What is the first thing? First thing is, he makes his relationship with Yahweh exclusive. Exclusive. He says, we as a household will worship Yahweh only. So please remove every foreign god that you have among you and put them away because we are going to worship the true God. Incidentally, actually, even Joshua, you know, all of us know Joshua's this thing, you know, it is a, it's a most famous wall plaque that hangs around. What is that? Me and Miss Household, right? We'll serve the Lord. That was spoken in Bethel. Same place, right? 
So, 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 so what Jacob does is two things, as I said. The first thing is Jacob makes sure that his exclusive relationship with Yahweh becomes exclusive. No other gods, only one God, the true God, Yahweh, and Yahweh alone. Second is he acknowledges God's grace on his life. He says, my, I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way which I have gone. So he acknowledges God's presence with him throughout, the, throughout, throughout his life and his grace, especially at, in times of distress. And Jacob wants to make sure that his household will also worship only one true God, the God of Abraham and Isaac. And then Jacob goes on to confirm the relationship. If you, if you, go, if you, if you read the story again, what, 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 what Jacob does is he names the altar he creates there as El Bethel. And there's a difference between Bethel and El Bethel. What does Bethel mean? House of God. What does El Bethel mean? The God of the house. Okay. You get that? Bethel is house of God. El Bethel is God of the house. So, I mean, I, I, I was amazed by this. Just by that slight shift in the name, what he is doing is shifting the focus from the place, the house of God, to the God of the house. Isn't it beautiful? Isn't it beautiful that he is shifting the focus from, you know, because <laughs> you remember, we, 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 we started this whole series by that challenge. Can we consider having an encounter with God as one of the objectives for coming to church? We are sure are coming to the house of the God. House of God. But are we coming to meet with the God of the house? Or are we coming for some other purpose here? Are we coming into the house of the God, house of God, or are we coming to meet the God of this house, God of this church? You see, we, this is the house of God. Not sure, not, no, no, no doubt about it. When we when we come to church, we know that we are going to the house of God, and that's what we say. But then the problem is we can come to the house of God for different purposes. What we should remember is our comfort should not come from coming to the house of God. Our comfort should come from coming to meet the God of the house. We are not going to Bethel. We are going to meet with El Bethel. You remember Jacob missed it the first time. Remember in Genesis chapter 28, Jacob missed it. He was in Bethel. And that's why he termed the name, he, he, he named the place Bethel, house of God. But then this time, after he has had encounters with God and after his last encounter with God, where God comes to him at his lowest point in, his, in times of his distress. And then of course, as you can see, he protects him through the journey from this place, from Shechem, to the uh, to, to Bethel, he protects them. The, the Bible says that God puts such a terror in the hearts of the people in the nations around him that nobody dare to touch him. He protects him at the lowest point of his his this thing. When he was in distress, he comes and he gives him. He encounters him, and then he protects him, takes him to this thing, and then, then. Jacob's relationship with God is cemented. Jacob's relationship changes from going to the house of God to go to worship the God of the house. God of the house. And we know the results of that, the remaining story of Jacob. We don't have to go into details of that. He once again gets renamed as Israel. He was first named as Israel in Bethel 1.0. But then later, he again gets renamed as uh, Israel. And then uh, God actually meets or brings true his Abrahamic covenant, the covenant that he made with Abraham 
through Jacob by 12 disciples, including the birth of Benjamin, the 12th, 12th son. Because you, as, as you will know, this, know, know the story, with Benjamin's uh, birth, uh, Leah dies. Right? So the Leah's death and Benjamin's birth are, are together. So that is the last son. So we make sure that he has his 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel, so that through them, the promise that he made to Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant comes true through um, Jacob's offsprings. So much so that Jacob is mentioned in the hall of faith. Where is the hall of faith in New Testament? Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews chapter 11, 21, it says, Jacob, by faith, blessed the sons of Joseph while he, before dying, before dying. So he gets a place in the hall of faith because of the encounters that he, he had with God. And because and through those encounters, his relationship status changed from doesn't care about, don't care about God to acknowledging God's presence to making God's relationship exclusive and saying that he is the God of my house. So this morning, let's be sure of one thing. God encounters will change our relationship with God. Will change. Here is the challenge for us. If we have been passive in our relationship with God, if we have been passive in our church attendance, if we have been passive in worshiping God, it's only through encounters with him that we can get closer to him. No other way. No other way. Encounter him through the word of God. Encounter him through prayers. Encounter him through uh, through the messages, encounter him in your one-on-one, -on -one, in your solitude, encounter him. Seek encounters. And as I said, the first part is always there. It's only you who needs to go and seek that. If we don't do that, if we don't do that, what will happen is our relationship with God will become lukewarm. As Jesus says to one of the churches in Revelation, right? It will become lukewarm. Our love, the first love that we had for Jesus, will not be as 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 you know explosive. It will it will become lukewarm, and our relationship with God will become lukewarm. So, if we want to avoid that, if we want to stop being a passive churchgoer, if we want to if we, if we want to become active worshippers of God, active worshippers of Jesus Christ, seek His encounter on a day to day basis. I talked about two, so that was the that was the vertical relationship that we spoke about. Let us also look at the uh, the horizontal relationship, right? Horizontal relationship uh, with uh, you know this thing. Let me again take Jacob. You know Jacob's case. You know he has always been messing with people, right? Uh, he he had problems with Esau. He runs away. He has problem with Laban. He runs away back, right? So he is constantly on the run. He's a man who is constantly on the run, right? And and then on the way back from Padan, from Laban's place back to um, you know, his, his father's land is where he has the, 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 the most famous encounter of uh, Jacob. What is the most famous encounter of Jacob with God? The wrestling match, right? He wrestles, wrestles with God. And then, and that is where, of course, Jacob's name changes for the first time. Genesis 32, 20, 32, 28. It says, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. What is God telling him? God is telling him. First, of course, he asked him, what is your name? And then the, probably the first time Jacob tells, my name is Jacob. I am a deceiver. I am a cheater. And then God says, you are no, you no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. But, but why? Because... You have struggled with God, right? Your relationship with this God has not been perfect, and with men, and with men, and prevailed. Just take 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 a look at that second part of the dialogue. You have struggled with God and men, with men, right? And it's a loaded statement, and because this is what Jacob has been doing all his life running away from Esau because Esau wanted to kill him, running away from Laban because Laban was cheating him. He was, he was, he was, he was, he was, he was running away. He was struggling with men. But this is the first time where God tells him, you have prevailed with men 
I mean, you have struggled, you have struggled with men, you have wrestled with men, and you have prevailed. You will win in your struggles with men. In other words, God is telling Jacob, look, this wrestling match, you're winning, and you're not just winning this match. I'm not just letting you win this match. This wrestling match, his struggles with men are over. You don't have to struggle with men anymore. You have prevailed. Before this encounter, Jacob was terrified of Esau, isn't it? It's terrified. I mean, you look at the, look at the look at what what his preparations he does to make sure that Esau doesn't have a chance to kill him. Right? He makes tremendous preparation, elaborate preparations to ensure that you not know, to, to please Esau and probably to reduce his level of anger and all that. But Jacob's encounter with God changes that. You see, immediately after the encounter, immediately after the encounter, we see that. When Esau meets Jacob, it is not with a sword. He's not pulling out his sword to cut off Jacob's head. He is hugging this guy and he is kissing him. He is restoring his relationship because God already told him that, yes, you have prevailed. You have succeeded after struggling with men. Because Jacob's confidence is restored as Genesis 43, 30 says, I have seen God uh, face to face and my life is preserved. I have seen God, 32, sorry, 32, 32, 32, 30. It says, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. If I have seen God and my life is preserved, I'm sure I, my life will be preserved when I see Esau. So his, 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 his relationship with Esau was already mended during the wrestling that he had with God. When Jacob persevered and confessed his true identity before the Lord, and at the, encounter, at the end of the encounter, Jacob knew that if God's grace has saved his life, Esau cannot harm him. And if, if God's grace has saved his life, Esau cannot harm him. When we encounter God, our broken relationships will be restored. Whether it is your, with your spouse, whether it is with your children, whether it is with your parents, whether it is your friends, whoever it is, any relationship, broken relationship that you have will be restored. What does Jesus say about broken relationships? Can one of you read Matthew 5, 23 to 24? Matthew 5, 23 and 24. Yeah. If you have something against your brother, leave your gift there before the altar, go back Reconcile yourself with the brother and then come back and offer your gift. Reconciliation is a precondition for worshiping God and offering your gift to God. When we have an encounter with God, we'll be able to restore our broken relationships. We have studied Paul and Peter, and you, you, you will notice that in their epistles, in Paul and Peter's epistles, they talk about relationships, restoring relationships elaborately, both of them, Paul as well as, as, well as uh, Peter. In my book, Not So With You, I explain what I call as the behavior of emotional healing that restores relationship. Now, the fact is, this is possible only when we are truly able to forgive and truly dispense grace. So an understanding of forgiveness and a deeper understanding of grace is required for this. I have said this before, but let me explain this again. What do we, how do we, how do we understand grace, right? I think for understanding grace, we have to understand the difference between justice, mercy, and grace. What is justice? 
Justice is when you get what you deserve. You do a good job, you get rewarded. You do a bad job, you get punished. And the quantum of reward or punishment is proportional to the, you know, the amount of the, the, the amount of good work or the severity of the bad work that you have done. That is justice. You get what you deserve. That is justice. The whole human society is built on that justice system, the Supreme Courts, and all that is built on that on that premise, you know, of 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 justice. But then about justice is mercy. If justice says that the convicts of uh, you know Nirbhaya uh, uh, rape rape rapists they have to be hung, that is justice. They did a crime. They 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 needed to. They, they needed to pay with their lives. What's the only recourse available to them? They can appeal to the president for mercy. Mercy petition. What does mercy petition mean? Mercy petition means, Lord, I know that I deserve this punishment, but will you please spare me of this punishment? That's what mercy is. So mercy is when you get spared of the punishment that you deserve as per justice. Mercy is when you get spared of the punishment that you deserve. So what is grace? This grace is above, you know, the, the, the justice is at the bottom of the pyramid. Mercy is slightly above. Grace is really at the top of the pyramid. Grace is where you don't only, not only get spared of your punishment, instead you get rewarded. Can you believe that? Right? You... You, you are a terrible person. What you need is actually punishment, but you are spared of the punishment. But, and instead of, you know, more than what getting spared of the punishment, you're offered eternal life. You're offered a room in Father's house. That is grace. That is grace. You know, I talk about grace even in my corporate settings. In the servant leadership trainings that I do in corporates, I talk about grace. And it's, it's not a concept that is easy for them to gra grapple because it is, I, but, but, but I tell them, look, if you want to get an argument with me on, on grace, please remember this. Grace is illogical. You cannot explain it through logic. So if you want to argue with me on logic on grace, please spare your time. It will not work. It is illogical. I, I tell them that, look, if you want to talk about grace in the, in the, in the context of fairness, forget about it. Grace is unfair. Grace is unfair. Grace is illogical. But that is the grace that was released on the cross when Jesus hung there and said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Isn't it amazing what Jesus did? That's what grace is. So if you have to understand that grace and be able to dispense that grace to others, it's not just about receiving grace, isn't it? It's about also dispensing grace to others. We need that encounter with God. We need the encounter with the God of the cross. We need the encounter with Jesus. It's not something that is humanly possible. Because human beings, we, we will look for logic. We will look for fairness. But that's not what grace is. It is illogical. It is unfair. It is unfair that the God who, is, who, was, who, was, who was sinless bore our sins and even was forsaken by his own father for us, for our sake. That Jesus is calling us to have an encounter with him and just restore our vertical relationships with, with God. He's paved the way for that, isn't it? He paved the way for that. He paid by his own blood so that we could have restore the relationship with God, our vertical relationship with God, and our horizontal relationship with others. So as we come to the communion table this morning, let's use it as an opportunity to thank him. Thank him for what he did on the cross. Right? The writer of Hebrews says, for a will to be effective, the writer of the will has to die. That's what Jesus did. By humanly standard, by worldly laws, the writer of the will needed to die so that the grace or, or the riches that God promised, we can, 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 we, can, we can inherit that. And that is what Jesus did on the cross. He died so that we can inherit the riches of God. 
you know, the Sunday school uh, uh, you know, expansion of grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. That is really what it is. So this morning, as we come to, the, come to the communion table, let us remember him. Let us thank him. Let us thank him because for, for, for helping us to make our vertical relationship with him all right. Because without the broken body of Christ, without the blood of the new covenant that was shed on the cross, we will have absolutely no part in the kingdom of God. I tell you. We will have absolutely no part in the kingdom of God. We can stand here, we can sit here and claim to be part of the kingdom of God only because of his broken body and the blood that he shed on the cross. Isn't it? Yeah. So it is by his grace and his grace alone that we can come to this table. We are not coming to this table by our own rights. We are not coming to this table because of the works that we have done. We are not coming to this table because of anything else, but because he has suffered his grace upon us. And we do have a responsibility before coming to the table of the Lord. What is our responsibility? Can one of you read 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight? 28? One Corinthians eleven twenty eight. This is where Paul talks about the Lord's Supper. Before eating the bread, before drinking the cup, let a person examine himself or herself and see what are the relationships that we need to mend. And Paul is addressing to the people who are fighting among themselves in Corinth, right? And the message is very applicable for us today. Approaching the Lord's table is an opportunity for us to examine ourselves and seek God's help to mend our relationship with others. So, can you close your eyes, please? And just examine yourselves.